Good evening, everybody. I know there are still people coming in and it's a hard time of day. You may have just finished being principal of homeschool, fourth grade math teacher and lunch lady. So a few minutes of grace, but we're gonna jump in because there's so much good stuff to talk about tonight. Good evening and welcome to the 11th annual Sandra J. Skolnick Lecture. My name is Laura Wheeldryer and I'm the executive director of Maryland Family Network. We are delighted to have you with us tonight. Even in these strange virtual times, we are sorry not to see you in person, but we're thrilled to be able to do this anyway. This lecture series was named to honor the legacy of Sandra J. Skolnick, a visionary leader and champion for young children, their families, and other caregivers. This is the only event of its kind in Maryland that brings together great thinkers and great doers in the field of early care and education to present and discuss the latest research, policy, and our visions for the future. Maryland Family Network's mission is simple. We ensure young children have strong families, quality early learning environments, and champions for their interests. All of these are critical for children to succeed in school and really throughout life. Of course, this mission is not accomplished only by our staff. It happens every day thanks to your engagement and leadership in the field of early childhood care and education, your efforts as an advocate in Annapolis, your passion as a parent, and all of the ways that you make life better for Maryland's little kids. It is now my pleasure to welcome several people whose support makes events like tonight possible. First, I wanna say welcome to Maryland Family Network's Board of Directors who have joined us tonight. Brian Eeks, Joanne Hampson, Dr. Nancy Grasmick, Tim Lewis, Rich Wickland, Mike Gill, Dr. Robert Blum, and Reggie Cohen. Thanks so much for being here. Next, I wanna welcome our Maryland Family Network's Champions for Children and Build the Nest Society members. We truly could not do this without your support. We also have some funders from local and national foundations and Mr. Stephen Hicks, Assistant Superintendent for the Division of Early Childhood from our biggest supporter, the Maryland State Department of Education. My next welcome is to someone who works tirely in Annapolis on behalf of children and families. Thank you for joining us tonight, Delegate Jared Solomon. And finally, thank you to the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, who has been our dedicated partner on this event for all 11 years. In particular, we appreciate the leadership of our friend and colleague, Dr. Cynthia Minkovitz who is the William H. Gates Senior Professor and Chair of the Department of Population, Family and Reproductive Health at the Bloomberg School of Public Health and a Professor of Pediatrics in the School of Medicine. Hard to fit that all on one business card. It is my pleasure to now welcome and turn things over to Dr. Minkovitz who will introduce our speaker. Take it away, Cynthia. Thanks so much, Laura, and it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here to join Laura in welcoming you and to introduce you to tonight's speaker, who, following the words that Laura had in describing the purpose of this uh, lecture, is a thinker, a doer, and a champion. But I'll give you a little more information to go along with that. So Dr. Depesh Navasaria is a pediatrician who works in the public interest. He's a physician a children's librarian, an educator, a public health professional, and a staunch child health advocate. In his day job, he's also Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and in the School of Public Health. And he's practiced primary care pediatrics in a variety of settings uh, that serve underserved populations. He's a founding medical director of Reach Out and Read Wisconsin, as well as the founder and director of the Pediatric Early Literacy Project at the University of Wisconsin. He's also keenly involved in advocacy training uh, at his institution, and he's been very active in the American Academy of Pediatrics, serving as the chapter vice president and also serving on national committees focused on early literacy and early childhood more generally. So he brings a really um, great background to his work in early childhood. 
So he grew up uh, after having been born in London. He was raised in New York City. His undergraduate education uh, was in biology and English literature. He earned his physician assistant uh, degree at George Washington in the District of Columbia nearby. And he practiced as a pediatric physician's assistant in Illinois before he then went on to medical school. So he completed uh, not only medical training, but also a master's degree in library and information science at the University of Illinois, where he focused on children's librarianship. Imagine what it must be like to have been raised by a parent who's also a child's librarian. We'll have to chat about that offline sometime. He did his pediatric residency at the University of Wisconsin, where he now uh, currently resides with, with his family. And I just have to say to Peshwood, and an honor it is to welcome you uh, to teach all of us so we get to learn along with you and have a great discussion. Thank you so much for that, that, that kind introduction. And, and thank you, everyone, for, for being here this evening. Um, I'm... I will share my slides once the host gives me the privileges to do so. Um, so I'll wait for that to appear. I have to say, um, I have very fond memories of uh, being in and around Maryland when I was in PA school. I was uh, able to um, do a number of rotations, of course, in Maryland. And uh, one of my first, uh, um, my, my very first clinical rotation, actually, uh, when I was wandering around quite haplessly trying to figure out like, you know, where, where my patients actually were was at Mercy Hospital uh, in Baltimore. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a little sad that I don't have the opportunity to uh, be back in town in person, but, you know, someday it will all, it'll all happen. Um, I believe that just a little bit of housekeeping um, that uh, if there are questions, please do put them in the chat box. I have it up in the corner of the screen so that I can uh, keep, a, keep an eye on. If there's a question that comes, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, the Q&A box rather is where you'll pose questions um, for later. Uh, and then we'll have a good amount of time for us to be able to spend time doing so. Um, I'll also answer the question that many people have when after they've heard my bio and all the training and so on that I've done. Uh, yes, I have a lot of student loan debt. So we'll just get that out of the way. So let me start with, as always in the medical world, we have disclosure slides. I have no order in financial disclosure or no off-label and risk which is in my presentation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, although I always point out that I am never quite sure if the FDA has formally approved mouthing as a use of board books. Uh, this is my son who's mouthing this book here. Um, he's actually now a college freshman, so he's incredibly embarrassed that I show this photo. So, of course, I show it as often as I can. Uh, he's nowhere near Maryland, so you won't pass him on the street uh, and, and embarrass him by, by pointing at him. So, one of the things that I do in practice and that I train a lot of other people to do is to talk about sharing books together with the parents of young children and, and to spend time making sure that they're successful doing so. And, and we give books out at checkups as part of the Reach Out and Read program, which I'll, I'll talk about. And um, whenever I tell people that this is something that I, I do in practice and that I spend a lot of time telling others to do in practice, I often get this as an answer. Oh, that's so nice. Well, yes, it is really nice, right? It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful part of my job. But the thing is, I want to move people beyond this idea that, oh, that's so nice, to, to saying, really, oh, it's so good that you do that because that is absolutely critical, that it makes such a big difference there. I'm going to stop screen sharing for one moment here. Sorry, I just wanted to, I realized that as I was trying to get it started, I did not optimize it for later video, and I do not want to miss that. Okay, there we go. Okay, so, um, sorry, a little hiccup there. Okay, so on our brief voyage together today, we're gonna do a number of things. We're gonna talk about the science of early brain development. We're gonna talk about what happens when things don't, um, don't go so, so well. Um, and we are, I'm sorry, give me one moment here. I'm getting a little oddity here that, not sure if it's not sharing appropriately. Give me one second and I should have this back up in a moment here. 
Okay, we're going to try that again. Okay, there we go. Should be able to see that slide appropriately now. Um, so uh, on our br brief voyage together, we're going to talk about the science of early brain development. We're going to talk about the um, what happens when things don't necessarily go so well. We'll talk about just broad principles of solutions and then kind of wrap it up from there. Um, for many of you, you may say, hey, I've heard this, I know this, um, or Jay, this, gee, this connects to things I've heard in just a different way. I hope that you can use a lot of this material to be able to also advocate for the important work that you do, either directly with children and families, or to be able to connect with other people, um, or to make the case for what you do, or to support better the people that you do support who are serving children and families in whatever capacity you do that. Um, please know it's important and I, I would love for you to use anything that I share tonight um, uh, for, that, for that purpose. All right, however, as you heard, I am also trained as a children's librarian and I think everyone, including adults, deserves story time. So I'm gonna read a story to you first. It's a book called The Dot by Peter H. Reynolds. Many of you may know it. And you'll see the images appearing on the screen as I read out loud. <clears throat> Art class was over, but Vashti sat glued to her chair. Her paper was empty. Vashti's teacher leaned over the blank paper. Ah, a polar bear in a snowstorm, she said. Very funny, said Vashti. I just can't draw. Her teacher smiled. Just make a mark and see where it takes you. Vashti grabbed a marker and gave the paper a good, strong jab. There! Her teacher picked up the paper and studied it carefully. Hmm. She pushed the paper toward Vashti and quietly said, Now sign it. Vashti thought for a moment. Well, maybe I can't draw, but I can sign my name. The next week, when Vashti walked into art class, she was surprised to see what was hanging above her teacher's desk. It was the little dot she had drawn, her dot, all framed in swirly gold. Hmm, I can make a better dot than that. She opened her never-before-used set of watercolors and set to work. Vashti painted and painted. A red dot, a purple dot, a yellow dot, a blue dot. The blue mixed with the yellow. She discovered she could make a green dot. Vashti kept experimenting, lots of little dots in many colors. If I can make little dots, I can make big dots too. Vashti splashed her colors with a bigger brush on bigger paper to make bigger dots. Vashti even made a dot by not painting a dot. At the school art show a few weeks later, Vashti's many dots made quite a splash. Vashti noticed a little boy gazing up at her. You're a really great artist. I wish I could draw, he said. I bet you can, said Vashti. Me, oh no, not me. I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. Vashti smiled. She handed the boy a blank sheet of paper. Show me. The boy's pencil shook as he drew his line. Vashti stared at the boy's squiggle. And then she said, please sign it. We'll come back to that story because there's a reason that I chose it. But let's talk a bit about the world of the early brain now and try to explore what's, what, what's really known out there. Over 10 years ago, the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child released a landmark report where they did something really interesting. They said, let's take decades and decades of research and let's try to synthesize it into some key points that are supported by the research that really help us guide the advice we give the programs that we set up and the policies that we enact. The, rather than us getting confused, well, this study says this, but this one says something a little bit different and that, yeah, they said, let's, let's really try to take what all the studies seem to tell us and try to pull that together into some big points. And even though this report is over 10 years old, honestly, everything they've said in it is still valid. And in fact, has been even more supported by the research that comes since. So let's walk through those points. One, Child development is a foundation for community and economic development, right? We don't, we don't talk about kids this way usually, right? We don't think of kids as infrastructure. We don't think of the brain as infrastructure. When we say infrastructure, we're often thinking highways, bridges, tunnels, airports, right? Like that sort of thing. 
But the thing is that if you think about it, you need people to be in your society and you need capable people. And that's the foundation of a prosperous and sustainable society. So we need to be thinking not just about those physical things that you can point at as infrastructure, but the infrastructure of the brain as being part of societal infrastructure. That this is not separate from community and economic development or different from or in competition with, it is community and economic development. Number two, brains are built over time. This is really important to recognize. You can't just say, put all your money in the first thousand days of life and then forget it, you're good, right? If you got it right, then you can just stop, okay? Even though I focus a lot on the first, you know, 1,000, 2,000 days of life, you can't just say, oh, that's it. People still have learning needs. They still have support needs all the way throughout their lifespan, including well, 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 all the way through adulthood. But also, there's another important corollary here not just for lifelong support, but if things didn't go right early on, it doesn't mean that it can't improve later if we get it right, right? That, that I don't want anyone to walk out thinking, well, you know, if you don't get it right in the first five years, forget it. It's just not gonna work. Oh, it can work, we know that. It's just much harder. It takes more effort, it takes more resources, but it is possible. So let's get it right initially but don't give up on the people further down if things didn't go right. Brains really are built over time. Because kids have sort of an interesting kind of uh, way to think about their development and health trajectory, sort of like a three-legged stool. One leg of the stool is all the biological stuff, the things we look at traditionally in healthcare all the time. These are important, that's why we look at them. But then we recognized it wasn't just those traditional medical things that mattered. We said, oh, hang on, the socioeconomic environment matters, place matters, that the zip code that a child is born and brought up in matters more than their genetic code to their long-term outcome, outcomes is absolutely true. And, and I want to be clear about something. The fact that place matters, that zip code matters so much, that's not an, inevitably, an inevitability. It is actually a man-made phenomenon. And that means we can also change that, right? So we shouldn't just accept, oh, that neighborhood has bad outcomes. Well, yeah, why does it have bad outcomes? And we, we, we should be able to change that, right? That's, that's the way to be thinking about it. But then another element to this is not just the broad socioeconomic environment, it's also the micro environments that children are in. Who's at home? Who's in their neighborhood? Who's in their early childhood center? That those attachment and relationship patterns matter just as much as the other elements of what's going on here. And that's the part that I think we came to recognize the most recently and why there's so much focus on it. Because that brings me to the third point. Human brains are actually not all that developed at birth. Um, think about a, a farm animal, like a goat being born, right? A baby goat is standing up like within an hour or two, at, if not sooner, right? Human beings, how long does it take for us to stand? My goodness, right? Months on end. We're kind of useless when we're born in many ways. So we have a lot of built-in circuits for things, which we'll, we'll come back to later. But a lot of circuitry is just not yet developed and develops a lot in those first years of life. So the, the pattern for how one neuron connects to another is driven by genetics. Okay, great, wonderful. But the question of which neuron connects to what other neuron and for what purpose, ah, that is driven by experience. Okay, so do we want a brain that's wiring for love, for learning, for curiosity, for knowledge? Or do we want a brain that's wiring for fear, self-defense, anxiety, searching for food constantly, et cetera, et cetera? And what is it that, you know, and you, you need to have genes guiding the basic pattern, but then it's experiences that pick the rest. And you can't have one without the other. It's like a campfire. You need wood and you need a spark in order to get that campfire going. Okay, so how do we influence those experiences? Well, we do it through advice that we give, through programs we set up, and through policies that we enact. Okay, and then you might say, great, those are the levers we can pull right, to, to change and mold those experiences to be as supportive of young, healthy brain development. Okay, 
what is the thing that matters the most? What is the thing that we should be trying to protect and promote to the extent possible? This is what we call children's, the active ingredient, so to speak, is children's engagement in these serve and return, these nurturing, responsive, loving relationships with other parents, with other, other adults in their environment, right? Serve and return, like in tennis, right? You serve the ball, volley it to your partner, they volley it back, and you're going back and forth, back and forth, responding and reacting to each other um, in a uniquely tuned kind of back and forth. Some have called it almost like singing a, a jazz duet together, right? That you're, you're coming up with, with that on the spot. This is the heart of child development right here, okay? If you remember nothing else I say tonight, please remember this that what drives development forward in young children is this engagement in others, this back and forth that, 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 that they do. There is nothing else that drives development forward like that on its own. This means there is no toy on its own. There is no DVD. There is no app that on its own in young children will drive development forward. Those things only seem to work when there's a loving, caring adult sharing it together with the child. I don't care what it says on the box or the ad. There's no research evidence for kids under three um, showing that there's really significant benefit to any of these learning apps or so on. As one of my colleagues once has once said, there is no app to replace your lap. Um, if we were in person, I would tell you there's t-shirts available in the lobby saying that, but actually, no, we've never made t-shirts like that. Maybe we should. So that, so if you ask me, what is the thing we should be supporting, helping be successful, et cetera, it's that nurturing responsive relationship. And you'll, you'll see this come up over and over through what I say tonight. So I'm going to share a video to you, with you. Um, I used to work for Edtronic in Boston when I was an undergraduate, uh, the child development unit at Children's uh, in Boston. And uh, he'll explain this face-to-face -face paradigm. You'll see what happens when the back and forth goes well. What happens when it doesn't go so well with the recovery that occurs when it's when it's short term? I'll let him explain. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I mean like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions, and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. stuff that goes on that we all do with our kids. The bad is when 
something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. So when I was an undergraduate, I used to code these videotapes. And uh, this was about you know what we typically saw. So um, that wasn't hard. That wasn't the hard part. The hard part was when we saw mothers go into the still face and the baby didn't seem to respond. And you know, you'd, you'd be like, okay, what's what's going on here? There's, there's there's something not right here. And we came to recognize that it it, it was that the baby wasn't getting this back and forth interaction, so they weren't used to it. Now, I want to be really, really clear here. I don't for a minute believe that any of the parents in our studies are uh, don't care about their kids, don't want the best for them, um, you know, don't love them. There, there's no group out there that has cornered the market on loving their kids better than any other group, okay? So the thing is, is that we think of this back and forth interaction as being automatic. We think of being as natural, instinctual, all of that. Um, and it's not, it's actually learned behavior. We learned it by watching other people. So when somebody says, oh, I saw an ad on by the highway or on the bus or heard on the radio or whatever, saying, please talk, read, sing, play with your child, we're spanning an information gap, and that's good. I, you know, that's a, maybe people don't know. But the thing is, it's often not an information gap or an information gap alone. There's a bigger gap, which is a skills gap. How do I know that I'm doing it right? Do I know how to do this? Do I feel confident that I'm doing it? And if we don't span that skills gap, then it's almost just as bad as not, them not knowing it right at all, because then they don't do it. So we need to recognize how important this is and make sure that we're addressing that, that skills gap whenever possible. By the way, um, please make sure if you have any questions that you type them into the Q&A box um, and uh, the staff will be kind of going through that and uh, helping me uh, sort through that in order to answer them adequately at the end. We'll have plenty of time for questions. So please, if things are, are coming up that you're, you're wondering about, please do use that, use the Q&A box for that. Fourth point, uh, you need simple circuits and skills to do more complex things. I know that may seem obvious, but you know, come on. Um, it's uh, sometimes we need to point this out because people say, oh, kids are just playing all day in early childhood. How hard can that be? Well, um, actually play is not just merely about amusement for children. Um, play is the work of infancy. This is the work of developmental progress that they're doing. So. You need those simple skills in order to do more complex things. The fifth point we're gonna spend a little time on, this notion of toxic stress, which I'll, I'll define more carefully in a moment, but many of you may be familiar with this concept, but it has persistent effects on the neuroendocrine system and it damages the architecture of the developing brain and can really lead to lifelong problems in a number of, of different domains. So here are head CTs of two three-year-old kids. The, the So to orient you, this is like you're looking at the brain, almost like there's a cut here looking up into the brain, okay? The child on the left is a typically developing child. The child on the right is a child who underwent extreme emotional neglect, okay? Not physical neglect. They were fed and bathed and clothed and all that. Um, but they didn't have a lot of interaction. This is a child from a large warehouse style um, uh, orphanage in Eastern Europe in the 1980s. Too many children, not enough staff. They were just going around trying to get their needs met um, and not really spending time talking to them because they just couldn't. You can see without knowing a whole lot about head CTs, a big difference in those two brains. That one on the right is full with neurons. It's a good size, all that. The one on the left, the brain is small. It looks shrunken. It's not as dense with neurons. So just the psychosocial environment around children alone makes a big difference to this brain development. And I'm giving you an, an extreme example, by the way, just because you can see it very easily. There's more subtle changes um, that often happen that 
you know, I, I can't read on an MRI. I need one of, I need a radiologist to help me out with that. Now, we have a built-in stress response. Um, this is one, one of those things we are born with, because if you're walking along in the woods and suddenly a snarling bear jumps out at you, you, you want to have a response that says, uh-oh, danger, and you run or scream or fight or whatever has to happen. You don't want to be standing there thinking, hmm, I wonder if this is a nice animal. Maybe I should pet it, right? That would, that would be a really bad move. So that built-in stress response, which we think of as a, um, I, I, in my brain, I think of it as a, a, a big red alert button, right? And the bear jumps out and you, you, hit red, you hit the red alert button and your body just goes into overdrive, right? You release these stress hormones like cortisol and epinephrine and, 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 and whatnot. And you have a neurological response that says, I must protect myself at all costs. Okay, great. That is great for when you deal with a bear. And I hope that most people are not dealing with a bear more than occasionally, hopefully ne never. Um, however, if you're a young child who doesn't have protection from this, these big life stresses, then you all you have is that red alert button, right? You can't just, you know, go, Oh, um, gee, you know, this person seems to be, um, be hitting me. I should report them to the authorities. Well, that doesn't work when you're two, right? You don't have these more complex problem solving um, systems, uh, ways, logic, higher thought, whatever. So all you have is that red alert button and you use that over and over. Now, so you can think about different levels of stress. I want to, I want to highlight something here. I, I, by no means am I saying that children should have a stress-free life because there is such a thing as positive stress, okay? Positive stress is how you actually learn things. You develop new skills. This is why we give people exams, et cetera. Um, the little hiccup I had at the beginning of, uh, of this with the, um, with the slides appearing, um, I know how to deal with that because I've had it happen before and I, I know where the right settings are. Right. These are good things because it lets you kind of develop new skills, be smoother at things, et cetera, et cetera. So small amounts of stress, no, no big deal, actually a good thing. Then you have tolerable stress. These are serious stressors, but they're temporary and they're buffered by those supportive relationships. Ah, there's that relationships piece again I was talking about. This is in contrast to toxic stress. This is when the stress response systems kick in, just like tolerable, but they stay there for a long period of time and there's few or no protective relationships. And that protective relationships piece is really key. That, that, that's the, maybe the primary factor distinguishing level of stress. Someone's life could be filled with tolerable stressors, but if they didn't have those relationships, they would actually be toxic, okay? Um, there's actually great work coming out of um, the, uh, the, the, that has come out of looking at Hurricane Katrina, um, that families who uh, went through Katrina, um, the biggest factor in terms of long-term outcomes for those uh, uh, the children was actually, did the family stay together and support one another, right? Did they do all those sorts of things? Um, and that really made a, made a big difference. All right, so what if it's worse in a child's life? What if they don't have those supportive relationships? These are situations like child abuse or parental substance abuse or homelessness, right? These are the stressors that when they're young, when they face this and there's few or no protective relationships, we call it toxic stress because of what it does to their physiology. If an 11 year old, had a perfectly good, supportive, nurturing home, et cetera, et cetera, and then everything went bad at age 11. You know, even that 11-year-old, I'm not going to argue it's great for them, but they, they have some problem-solving skills. They have some ways to, to cope, et cetera. A two-year-old doesn't have that, right? So it does things to how they, they, they respond to the world. So, so what is that? When they have these stressors, they respond with that red alert button, right? That, that bear response. This fight, flight, or freeze, as it's sometimes also called, becomes chronic, right? They're always looking for danger because that's what's surrounding them, right? And their brain is wired to look for danger. They pump out these stress hormones. It causes changes in their brain um, that, that really are around 
fear or on self-defense or on looking for safety and so on. But here's what we see in healthcare, what we see in early childhood settings, we see in schools, we see in social work, we see, we see in so many different settings that are in and around um, families and young children is this hyper-responsive stress response. They're not as calm, they can't cope as well. And that in turn feeds into more childhood stress, right? So think about this. A child who grew up in a loving, nurturing home and sees a little frown on their preschool teacher's face, that little frown may mean, oops, <laughs> shouldn't have done that. Oh, well, you know, no big deal. Barely noticed by anyone. Whereas in a child who grew up in, a, in an environment where they were constantly dealing with these threats, that little frown actually says, uh-oh, someone's about to hit me. Someone's going to raise their voice and yell. Someone's going to throw something. Danger, I need to protect myself. The red alert goes off and it's, it's self-defense, it's self-protection at all costs, right? And the thing is when that kid goes running down the hall from, some, from something that seems inconsequential and everyone says, oh, what's wrong with that kid? That's actually the wrong question. The question should be, what happened to that kid? Now, I, don't, don't get me wrong. You don't just let kids run down the hall. You need to keep them safe and everyone else around them safe and, and, and learning environment and all that. But when we start asking the right questions, we hopefully start to move towards eventually the right answers. So what is it that happens when these things don't go so well? Many of you may be familiar with the ACEs or Adverse Childhood Experiences study, but there's still a lot of people in the public who, who don't necessarily know about it, which is why for them I call it the most important study they've probably never heard of. This is a study of um, over 17,000 adults and looked retrospectively back at um, their childhood and tried to link what happened to them in terms of abuse and neglect and so on to their, their outcomes across the years. Really amazing study. I wanna point out that even for people who are familiar with the study, they sometimes forget and say, oh yes, 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 that's the study of what happens to people who live in poverty. Actually, the people in the study were not impoverished. They were middle-class folks. They were mostly Caucasian. They were college educated, now in their 50s, and it was split evenly between men and women, right? So this is actually not a study of poor people. This is a study of the middle class. So please don't think that, that, oh, this is stuff that only happens to people living in poverty. Actually, we also have studies showing it happens to people in high socioeconomic status settings as well. It's just that, of course, they have more resources, they have more buffers, um, and, and, uh, and so on. So, you know, keep that in mind. But it's not that, that this is sort of immunity there. These are the different types of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction that they um, uh, looked at. Yes, there's more ACEs you could put in here, and many new studies have, have added other things, but this is just what they went with. The numbers appearing on the right are the prevalence of this in that population. These are crazy high numbers. They did not expect to find numbers this high. I mean, my goodness, 26% said they were physically abused at least once during their childhood. They did not expect a quarter of people to say that. Even the lowest number on there is over one in 20, which is quite a few people. Now, the problem with ACEs is that you can't just simply um, add up a number and say, well, your abuse was twice as bad as yours. Um, it it just doesn't work that way, right? So how do you actually measure intensity in any way, shape, or form. So they said, you know what, let's just ask people how many of these categories they said yes to. Um, how many of them are, are, are uh, uh, you know, whether it happened once or happened 12,000 times, just say yes or no, and then add that up. And that's how you get an ACE score. A third said none, I didn't have any of these, great. But a quarter had at least one and four or five or six, well, it's one in 20 for each of those. And they said, wait a minute, these are not just common. The effects are cumulative when we look across categories of ACEs, because it's one of the few ways you can kind of get something approaching intensity of, of experience. So let's look at a couple of examples. This is your risk of developmental delay in the first three years of life, okay? Um, if you had five, six, or seven adverse childhood experiences, you had 
75 to nearly 100% chance of being developmentally delayed in the first three years of life. And that takes a lot of resources and you know, all sorts of things, right? Compared to a much lower number if you just had one or two. So big difference there. This next slide is the one that blew my mind when I saw it. This is your risk for adult heart disease based on your ACE score. If you had seven or eight adverse childhood experiences, they found a tripling of your risk for heart disease as an adult compared to someone who had none. Tripling? My goodness, right? We, we, we have almost no other factor that triples your risk like that, right? And this is decades upon decades later. So early adversity, trauma, et cetera, is building into the biology of young children changes that are playing out even in very, very physical health matters like heart disease, because heart disease is expensive, right? I mean, catheterizations and medications and visits and open heart surgeries and you know all, all sorts of things that go on there. Um, but we can trace that back. And there's probably some biological plausibility for this if you start to connect up what happens with um, uh, uh, if you start to think about cortisol and what cortisol does, it's, you start to understand, okay, we think we understand how these things happen. And if we can prevent them, we'll make a big difference here. And just to answer a question that came by in the chat, yes, you will have access to the slides. Um, and uh, all the videos I showed tonight um, are on YouTube and the URLs will be in the corner. So if you don't have a high bandwidth con um, uh, uh, connection, um, uh, or if you uh, want to inflict the videos on your family, et cetera, uh, you should have access to them. But the last point that they um, mentioned in, in this report was that if we get the right conditions for early childhood development, it's more effective and less costly than trying to get it done later on. Again, yes, we can fix things later on. We can do all sorts of things, but it's so much easier if we do prevention, prevention, prevention. Okay, so Jack Shankoff at the Harvard Center for the Developing Child points out a few things. He says, one, we got to reduce the emotional and behavioral barriers to learning. And you know what? He is absolutely right. I regularly work with youth who have amazing intellects. They are smart. They are knowledgeable. They are thoughtful. There's all sorts of things that are so great about them. And we will never, ever, ever see probably their, their potential um, flourish and thrive. Where do I see them? When I go and do clinical work at our county juvenile detention center. Right? These intellects have been papered over with so many layers of behavioral issues, emotional problems, et cetera, that are not getting properly addressed, but it's so hard at that point to kind of come back around. What are we losing when, when we lose kids like that, right? We, even if you say, I don't care about those kids, fine. What about what they might do for all of us, right, as a society? How, which one of them might figure out cures to cancer? or how to get us to Mars, or how to write amazing symphonies, or whatever the case may be, right? We lose out, our children lose out when, when we don't get it right for, for other kids who have these amazing intellects. We, we, we're losing that brain power as a society. So we need to figure that out and make sure that, that we're, we're not leaving these layers in place. Number two, I think you all know this, but sometimes we have to say this really, really carefully. Children live in families, so you can't just only say we're going to help children, but only children. You got to help their parents. Parents are the single biggest influence on children, so you have to transform their lives. I had a parent once; um, uh, it wasn't even in the office. It was their spouse who brought the the their kid in for a, a, a three year old well child visit. Dad, who was not there, is the primary caregiver for this child during the day because he worked nights. Dad is profoundly depressed. M Mom knew it, dad knows it, etc. cetera. Um, kid was trying, escalating his behavior to try to get some sort of response out of his dad. He's three, you know, what do you expect? And so kid was acting up and that's how this conversation got started was like, wait, he's acting up. Okay, well, why is he acting up? And you know, and then we uncovered, oh, dad's profoundly depressed. Why is dad, so I could say, well, we should have our psychologists meet with them and explain how important it is that he interact and do these nurturing, responsive, serve and return relationships. 
Um, why is dad not getting his depression treated? Well, because he has no health insurance. Okay, so no, I don't need a psychologist. I need someone to actually figure out how to get him mental health care, which we did. We, we got it sorted out, right? So we need to recognize that it's not just simply lecturing people about what they should be doing, that sometimes there's a lot of barriers in the way. And then finally, health and well-being is not just health care. Um, it's really all of us and all of what we do. Um, clinical care is only about 20% of what influences health outcomes. Um, that's data from the UW Population Health Institute right here at, uh, on my campus. So some numbers to remember. There are 700 new neural connections happening per second in the developing brain. We want them to happen really well. So let's make sure that we, we, we do so when this is happening in, in uh, infancy and toddlerhood. There's also this idea of brain plasticity. And if, if that term sounds too technical, the other synonym you can drop in there is brain adaptability. Okay, there's two types, synaptic and cellular. Don't really worry about what they mean. The key is actually here in this third line. Synaptic plasticity is lifelong. It's what we're all using to learn. Cellular plasticity, um, which probably none of us have anymore because it's declining by age five, unless your family members are, are watching this with you and, and are younger. Um, that gets lost already um, uh, is on the way out by age five. So we lose one of the two types of adaptability we have. This diminishing cellular plasticity limits some of our ability to do remediation. It's not that you can't remediate, right? We, you still have synaptic, but it is much harder to fix um, a, to fix speech delay at age three than it is at age eight. Don't wait till eight. And actually it's a lot easier at 18 months than it is at age three and so on and so forth. We can measure disparities in vocabulary in, in, uh, in by 18 months. This, this graph shows you receptive vocabulary, the ability of children to understand words. Three different socioeconomic strata. And you can see that by 18 months, the richest kids are already pulling away from their less affluent peers. And by 24 months, we see the middle class kids pulling away. So this is not, this is all before preschool, right? 36 months is the right edge of the graph here. So they haven't even hit preschool. When we talk about the achievement gap, we'll solve the achievement gap when we do serious and substantial investment in the first thousand days of life and then support those gains well throughout the rest of preschool, school, et cetera, et cetera. And then for the economic argument, for every dollar we put into early childhood, there's actually four to $9 in returns. Okay, I'm a pediatrician. I am not qualified to make that assessment, but James Heckman is. He's a Nobel laureate in economics at the University of Chicago. This is his life's work. It's not that we get no rate of return on job training, schooling, et cetera, but the earliest years are where you get the best bang for your buck. So the, if people are, are worried about that, that's uh, go, go to his website and, and it, it, it pulls it all out there for you. And long before we had MRI scans, Frederick Douglass reminded us, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. <laughs> he did not need MRI scans and cortisol assays to figure that out. I also wanna say a little bit about the reality of now the fact that we're all sitting here on uh, listening to a virtual presentation instead of me being in front of you um, in Maryland. Um, yes, there's a lot going on in our world and families are facing a lot of challenges and they need support. Obviously we have a global pandemic. This is old data, so please don't squint too much at the, at the numbers, it's just a screenshot, right? And of course it happens to coincidentally be from, from Hopkins. Um, but right at, the, at this point, right, a million cases in the US, you know, we're well beyond that. But there's a lot of people that have been infected by the virus and are dealing in some way with the effects of that infection. And that's important. But that at that point was about a million. How many families are there in the US? Hey, 83 million families. Many more people are having to deal with the effects of this pandemic that go well beyond the infection alone. And this is not to downplay infection and the need to protect people who are vulnerable to infection. Okay, I wanna be really clear about that. But it's to say that of course this pandemic has much, much more significant effects that do affect families and of course, children. And the thing is, a lot of these struggles have always been present. 
Okay, child poverty is actually not new to our country, and we have actually shockingly high child poverty rates in the United States compared to other developed nations. Um, when I throw around that data, people are often shocked by it. But this pandemic and everything that's going on has now laid those things bare in ways that we're actually paying attention. We weren't paying attention often before. Now a lot more people are paying attention because it's hitting so many more people and they're seeing what's going on there. And of course, there's what's been going on in terms of, of racial justice and, and so on. And I just want to point you to this amazing policy statement from um, August of 2019, so a year ago, from the American Academy of Pediatrics on the impact of racism on child and adolescent health. Um, you can Google this and download it for free. Um, it points out that this is a significant health concern and a significant threat to the well-being of, of, uh, of children. So with all this and thinking about how we work with families and others, I was reminded of a quote from the writer Anatoly Broyard, who, who in the, amidst a long, long extended illness, talked about how his ideal doctor would be his Virgil. So he's referring to the Dante's The Divine Comedy to the Inferno when Dante as the author and the lead key character is going through the levels of hell and the the um, Roman poet uh, Virgil is, is his guide. And he says, he would be my Virgil leading me through my purgatory or inferno, pointing out the sights as we go. Um, he would see the genius of my illness. He would mingle his daemon with mine. We would wrestle with my fate together. And as throughout this pandemic and all the upheaval that our society has been and continues to experience, I, rem I remembered this and it made me think about how what we in the fields that help children and families, that we are much like this, right? That we are hoping to be that guidance for families. And I just wanna share a couple of bits of artwork with you to make this point. Um, this is Coke, um, Dante and Virgil in the second circle of hell. And um, you can see on the, in the lower right there, the, in the left with the laurel wreath on his head is Virgil and on the right in the red is Dante. And you can see his, his hand, um, uh, Virgil's hand out there pointing out like what he's seeing and helping him understand um, this, this odd, strange journey that, that, that they're on. The other piece I'll share with you now is from Delacroix, um, Dante and Virgil in hell, and you can see again there Dante in the red, looking down with horror at what's going on before him. You just see the look on his face. You see he's kind of leaned over, losing his balance. But look, Virgil's right next to him, again with the laurel wreath, and he's holding his hand. He's supporting him. He's keeping him up there to make sure he doesn't fall over. And in a sense, that's what we've been doing for so long, right? We're trying so hard to keep families, to keep children, to keep our friends and each other, um, giving them a little bit of support there as much as possible. We'll come back to this a little bit. So now that I've depressed everyone, what can we do about all of this? So I will give you the solution. Well, eh, not really. I'm gonna give you principles of solutions because um, there's no one magic thing that's, that's gonna fix everything. So we need to think about how we build capabilities in, in adults, right? Like how do we build that capability to do shared book reading or back and forth responsive interactions, right? If a parent doesn't know how to do it or isn't sure how to do it, we can encourage that, we can coach that, we can build that, great. We need to build capacity. Maybe the parent says, you know what? I actually love reading to my kids, but I can't do it because I work two jobs and I'm not at home in the evening. And why do I work two jobs? Because I don't get paid a living wage. Okay, well, the answer then is how do we build that capacity? How do we supplement their income? How do we advocate for living wages? You know, whatever the case may be. We wanna do things that are based in homes and communities. We wanna address root causes whenever possible. We wanna have long-term effects, use a prevention mindset, leverage those key first thousand days of life we want to use things that are evidence guided. You notice I don't say evidence based. Evidence based is great, but if you stick to only very, very strict evidence, then you're going to do the same 12 things over and over. And there won't be room for innovation, for trying new things, et cetera. So don't do things that are utterly nuts, but come on, you know, let there be a little bit of freedom to try new things that the evidence might hint at. And then, of course, things we can take to scale. Because this is the thing. Let's think about this, this, this in a chain of events. 
If we want productive, happy adults, great. We want them to be educationally successful for that to happen. That means they need that brain circuitry for school success. That means they need those early experiences that mold that brain. That means those nurturing, responsive interactions. This is just me summarizing kind of like everything I've said here. This is adults, this, you need adults who can put those skills into action that have that capability and capacity to do that interaction well with children. And that ultimately is driven by programs, policies, and advice, right? So if you want those happy, productive adults for all those other things to happen, the levers you can pull here are your programs, policy, and advice. And we can kind of lump them into two big categories. We can do things that are intensive, but small. Home visiting is a great example, right? A lot of time, a lot of expertise, a lot of things, great outcomes. Love home visiting programs. Evans Space home visiting programs are awesome. Problem, hard to scale because they cost a lot, right? We can't possibly get them to everyone who may need them without gigantic investments. And even then, right, that may not be quite enough. So together with these, not instead of, not competing with, but together with them, we need broader but scalable larger initiatives as well. And an example of one that I just want to spend a few moments talking about is the program I'm associated with, which is Reach Out and Read. Reach Out and Read is actually a program that's done in primary care offices. It's 30 years old and, um, and is in all 50 states. There's actually quite a few in uh, the Baltimore region, in DC, and throughout Maryland. And we use the regular checkups, that opportunity to talk to families about shared book reading. And again, people say, oh, you're giving out books. That's great. It's like, yes, but we're also actually trying to build those moments of connection, of responsive interaction, all these things. It's a vehicle to do that without boring parents with going on and on about the face-to-face -face and all that stuff, right? Like, let's give them that, that, that moment there. So um, if I had to summarize it in a single image, it would be this item here, what I call the prescription to read. Um, uh, you notice it doesn't say read books. It used to say that, and I changed it several years ago because I realized that wasn't actually what I wanted. What I want people to do is share books together. Have those moments, share those books, you know, and let's be successful and confident in that book sharing together. And this, for all the reasons I've shared with you tonight, may be one of the most uh, important prescriptions I ever hand a family. So... And I think of programs like Reach Out and Read as being like the blind men feeling the elephant, that, that you know, they all feel different parts of the elephant and describe it in different ways. Well, the elephant is programs like Reach Out and Read because people say, oh, you're giving away books. That's so great. Well, yes, it is great. But you know, we're doing a lot of other things too. We're doing an educational intervention. We're doing developmental surveillance. We're looking at that kid's development by what they do. We're helping build that parental capacity Parent might say, you know, my, my toddler doesn't like being read to. Well, really, that's interesting. Tell me what's going on. Oh, well, I read to him and he's, he just doesn't, he's, he's bored after two pages. I don't like reading either. So he's going to be like me, isn't he? Right? They're not going to say that part. They're going to think it. I say, no, no, no. Toddlers have naturally short attention spans. That is so completely normal what you're describing. You know what? Here, pull him up next to you. Let him hold the book. Let him go backwards in the book. Talk about the pictures. Can you find Max in this picture? Where's Max? Oh, there he is. Oh, and he's in a boat. What color do you think his boat is? Oh, it's a red boat. That's what we call dialogic reading, right? That make it a dialogue. I don't care if you don't read the story. I'm not going to make you write an essay on it, right? And then the parent says, oh, okay, I get it. That's what I'm supposed to do. Great, thank you, right? And they feel confident in that. Or if I see them read out loud, I can say, great, I like when he pointed at that. You said, oh, yes, that's a bird, isn't it? You know, and that back and forth. That's what I mean by coaching, skill building, et cetera. So we can build those parental capacities. We can buffer toxic stress by giving families a chance to spend time together, kind of tuck your kid in, read books together, um, hear that not parenting voice, you know, go clean your room, get in your pajamas, brush your teeth, you know. Um, we all have that parenting voice. I have two teenagers, right? You can't survive without it. We can assess relationships within families. The kid who takes that book, studies it, toddles over to their parent and holds it out in that read to me gesture. Oh, they've just told you tons, haven't they? They're saying, I know what this is. This is that thing that if I bring it to you 
and I hold it out, I think there's a good chance you're going to pull me up into your lap. We're going to open this book together and look at it together. And I want you to do it, right? There's a lot of knowledge that comes out of seeing that little thing happen in front of you. It's a public health approach. And of course, it's a scalable, actually strongly evidence-based model. And of course, programs like Reach Out and Read are not any one of these things. Ultimately, it's all of these things. So when we do good home visiting, good parenting support, good respectful skill building, asking families what their needs are, et cetera, we approach all these things and make, make a big difference. If you want to read more about this, just Google the elephant in the clinic. It's a short report a colleague and I wrote on all these parts of Reach Out and Read to help you kind of think about um, all these different elements. It's a pretty easy read. There's a ton of references if you want to get into the more technical stuff, but uh, not long and it's uh, absolutely free download. And if you're not sick of listening to me tonight, we also, as of this summer, have, and you've seen it in the chat box, the Reach Out and Read podcast. I'm the host, um, and we're having great fun um, talking to people about reading, children's books, parenting, uh, all sorts of things. So please subscribe, download, listen, and much like Uber, I hope you give us five stars. <laughs> so, um, we're not just an advice or a book giveaway, but it's really secretly this process of parental skill building and support. And that's what everything is pointing to, right? Build skills in the parents and support them in those skills. And whenever possible, use already existing skilled, trusted professionals, because that helps you be able to take this all to scale in some key ways. Two quick images I want to share. This is from a website called echoparenting.org. They, they are happy to have people share this. I have no connection with them at all. It gets back to some of the trauma language, um, you know, saying things like, oh, I'm here to fix you. Well, no, I'm here to support your healing. Um, what's wrong with you? What happened to you? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So if you go dig around on that website or when the slides, uh, when you have the slides, you'll see some of these. And then the other thing that I like is this, this, kind of pathway, it's not really a pathway, but when you see behavior that puzzles you in children, it kind of helps you think through the questions you should be asking. Um, is this a basic human need, right? Is this child hungry or tired, right? Maybe that's why they're acting out. Is it a developmental stage? A tantrum in a two-year-old is normal. In a 14-year-old, mm, not so much. Is it something about their nervous system? Is it overstimulated? Is there a medication effect or something going on? Is this that survival response? Is it a coping strategy that no longer works? Is there, are there structural changes in the brain? Is this trauma induced? And then finally, how is this problem for us grownups, professionals, whatever, a solution for that child? And it may be a solution that no longer works, but it worked at one point, right? And it gets something. If you, there's no easy answers to these things, but these help you kind of frame it in ways that help you at least get closer to asking the questions and getting to answers that at least set people on the road of how can we best help children and families that are really struggling. Because people, we need a solution for now as well. Um, in the midst of this pandemic and all the upheaval that we're facing as a society, families need support. We need to support the health of these relationships because we know that it is so key to protecting those brains. We talked about adverse childhood experiences. There's also positive childhood experiences, right? The relational health, the reading, all these things help buffer even in the face of adversity, much like I mentioned with the studies out of her uh, from Hurricane Katrina. Shared reading can be one way to scaffold it, but there's of course many ways that we can talk about these interactions and make them comfortable for families. Two more pieces from the Renaissance, Dante and Virgil again, to show us the positive things that can happen. Um, this is Virgil and Dante meeting some of the great poets of history. Um, and, you know, it reminds you that even amidst, amidst this pandemic, right, we've learned a lot about how to innovate, about how to adapt, and about some things that may actually be good to keep on after we've got this, you know, figured out and, and solved and back to a more normal um, uh, perspective. And then this image, this is Gustave Doré. They're, they're in the ninth circle of hell, and you can see this look of deep, abject sorrow on Virgil's face there in the, the kind of the bluish green there. But you notice Dante's next to him. And in this picture, it's Dante who has his arm around Virgil. And this reminds me, right, that it, we're human beings as well. 
And we too can take support and solace from those that we're serving because this is hard on all, on all of us um, as we're all watching this on screens and not able to be together and all, right? That sometimes those that we serve, we, we can derive strength uh, and meaning from what, what they have to offer us. So to wrap this up, just a few thoughts. I like thinking about a public health approach to building healthy brains. We know that kids are gonna fall, so we need a net to catch them. Our big net, our first net is the prevention net. It's a large net, but it's got some big holes. But hey, we hope it catches an awful lot of those kids. Great, but what happens to the kids that fall through those holes? That's when you haul out your second net. It's a smaller net with smaller holes. This is your screening, your targeted interventions, different ways you can make a difference there and catch these kids. You still got holes and you got kids who are gonna fall through, that's when you haul out your smallest net. This is your treatment net. You cannot have all the kids at the top hitting the treatment net because they're gonna fall off the edge. The treatment system cannot possibly handle them and handle them well enough, right? But if the top layers work, then the treatment layer can also work. It's also not possible to think that, oh, we can prevent everything. So all layers of this are necessary. None on their own are sufficient. So this means when I'm doing things like primary care and pre thinking prevention, 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 I need to make sure there's a good treatment system out there as well for those that do fall through the cracks. Likewise, I hope that the people thinking about treatment are also saying, hey, by the way, are you folks investing properly in prevention? We're all in this together, right? It shouldn't be that if I get money, your project doesn't. Wait a minute, no, we should be helping each other out here. We all should be supporting one another. So I like to think about this, and I'm not saying all of you need to be in these same, doing all three of these levels, but know who's doing the other levels and try to make sure that they're getting supported. I started today by reading to you from the dot. And why did I pick the dot? Well, because the dot is a story about relationships. It's a story about connections. And, you know, the teacher could have said to Vashti, oh, young lady, you need to get your assignment done. And if you don't pick, have a better attitude, then I'm going to send you off to the principal's office. Right? That wouldn't have gone well. Instead, she said, you know what? This child is having a bad day. It's fine. Make a mark, see where it takes you. And she celebrated what she did. And Vashti took off her innate talents, all those different colors and sizes and you know, techniques was all her. But you know, there's something else in that story that I really liked. We don't know if it was intentional skill building because we're not inside that teacher's head, but you notice what she did. What she did with Vashti, Vashti did later with that little boy. Make a mark, you know, may draw that line, and then she celebrated it. So it also shows how we can build our society's capacity when we get it right and do this well with, with others. And that's why I liked it. It's such a great story of human relationships there. Remember that public investment, the brain's capacity to change is greatest early, early on, but where do we post, put, mo put most of our money? It's later in school remediation, um, corrections, rehab, remediation, et cetera. And that's not to argue that we shouldn't be doing that, but we need to think about the magnitude of that. And we can make a difference. Back in 2013, the Wisconsin Senate um, and assembly uh, passed a joint resolution unanimously. Our legislature doesn't agree on anything, okay? So this is amazing. What did they say? Um, the uh, resolved clause was um, briefly resolved that policy decisions enacted by the state legislature will take into account early brain development, consider toxic stress, early adversity and buffering relationships and note early intervention investment as strategies to achieve a lasting foundation for a more prosperous and sustainable state through investing in human capital. I um, might have helped write most of that. Um, but the thing is, we passed this now, it's a resolution. There's no money tied to it, right? But it got us starting on talking about a children's caucus, which we did do, and some other elements out there. We were the first state legislature that passed something like this, and it got the words and the language in front of people. And it helped start all sorts of things, which is why I put the success kid there doing the fist pump and doing hashtag winning because it, it got things going. All right. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to skip my last video. It'll be there in YouTube for you to watch at a later point. 
Um, but I want to um, close with this uh, quote because I want to make sure we have time for questions. And if you've not gotten your questions into the Q&A box yet, please do. I'm, I'm excited to, to see what they are. This quote, um, while schools can do much to raise achievement among children who initially lag behind their peers, all too often preschool gaps set and train a pattern of ever increasing inequality during school years and beyond. Any drive to improve social mobility must begin with an effective strategy to nurture the fledgling talent in young children so often lost before it has had a chance to flourish. And that's what I see too much, right? That fledgling talent that's lost. We need to help those little birds fly and we need to think about how we can do that collectively as a society. And then I always close with this photo. Um, this is my wife reading to my son. Caught them years ago in this beautiful moment of being lost in a book together. Um, it, it's, it reminds me that children are made readers in the laps of their parents, but also that parents are their child's first and best teachers. So everything we do should be focused on how do we make sure that parents feel comfortable, confident, and capable of doing those things and that we that that they and that they are able to do that on a regular basis because that's where we'll really see the triumph of those young early brains and what they have to offer all of us and what they have to offer our future so with that my public facing social media links my email address if you ever have other questions that occur to you later um, and with that thank you so much for having me this evening and i look forward to being able to answer some of your questions thank you Okay, wow. I know everybody is clapping in their living rooms or at their dining room tables. Really exciting, fantastic, fantastic information. Thank you. And tons of questions. So I will um, skip the praise and go straight to questions. So I've tried to sort of organize the questions a little bit. Let's talk about books, since that was a big part um, of the evening. Um, question from a provider, any specific suggestions for engaging parents or supporting parents who themselves have low literacy levels? Oh, that's a great question. You know something? Um, parents are more likely to reveal their own literacy struggles to us when we do reach out and read than they are to tell their own doctors, right? Because it's considered a big shame, like, you know, it's stigmatizing, right? But they will tell us. So first of all, please refer them to adult literacy programs, right? Like they, th that this might be the motivation that they need in order to, to look at their own literacy and address it. The second piece is um, there's nothing saying that you have to read what the words on the page say. So if they're worried, oh, I can't adequately read to my child, fine, sit and talk about the pictures just like we talked about. And if you wanna really reduce the stigma, there's a bunch of picture books by the author David Weisner, W-E-I-S-N-E-R, um, his picture books are completely wordless, yet they tell rich, beautiful, nuanced stories solely through images. And then there's no stigma because there's no words there. So lots of different approaches there. And how about do you have um, recommendations of people who prefer Kindles or tablets for mm -hmm. reading versus good old fashioned books? Mm -hmm. So to a certain extent, text is text. And if you have text on a piece of paper um, versus um, on a screen, you're still doing the work of decoding those letters. Having said that, there's a few caveats there. One, um, many devices, iPads in particular, uh, but many, uh, don't only do books. They also allow you to play Angry Birds or whatever it is, right? And kids will demand the interactive, you know, flashy, music and lights and colors because those things are designed to grab your attention. So unless you're absolutely scrupulous as a parent, right, it's easy to fall into something that's not reading. Um, number two, you want to make sure the images and all come through as beautifully as they do on, on paper and all. Number three, be really, really, really careful of what we call enhanced ebooks, right? Oh, this is better than a paper book because it's not just a book on a screen but if you tap the cow, it'll go moo or whatever. Those extra things often actually distract from the reading and the story. And what a kid ends up doing is spending a lot of time 
trying to figure out what they can make the thing do rather than enjoying the words, the story, the images, you know, all those sorts of things. And there's actually really good research showing that the enhancements actually, um, kids actually kind of wall themselves off. You know, they, they've, they've, they've got the tablet and a parent's trying to interact with them. There's, there's research on this and they kind of turn away from their parent and like, you know, because they're so focused on what's going on. So this poor parent is trying to engage their child and the kid is just doesn't want to do it. So we had to be really careful about that. So there's nothing inherently deeply wrong with it. Just be aware of these things. Okay. Do you have a favorite book for kids or a favorite children's book for adults? <laughs> there are so many amazing children's books out there that I think it would be impossible to say there is just one. The one I often read, if it's not the dot, um, if I'm talking more about early literacy, is uh, Where the Wild Things Are, which many people know by Maurice Sendak, because it also helps me illustrate some points I like to make about early literacy. But th there's more amazingly well-done books, children's books out there than anyone can possibly read. I, I can't keep up. <laughs> so, uh, agreed. A very interesting and timely question in the chat was what your thoughts are. This is crossing your librarian view and your doctor view about the risks of having a lending library right now where um, providers or schools are sending books home with families because mm -hmm. a lot of them stopped during COVID. Mm -hmm. And we had a, a child care provider ask like, is it okay, is it safe to start that again? Yes, so look, here's the thing. Um, the, best, the best information we have is that the the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus or COVID-19 virus does not live longer than, if you say 72 hours without touching you know, uh, the object, it's fine. So what a lot of libraries are actually doing is that they're taking books or objects or whatever, and they're kind of putting them in quarantine, like in a dark room somewhere, give them 72 hours, take them out, and then for a little extra security, wipe them off right, with one of these sani cloths, sani wipe, you know, type of, you know, um, things that people are using to wipe off counters and tables and all that. Uh, and those are usually okay on most outer book surfaces and, and so on. Um, yeah, there's weak data about, oh, the virus can survive up to 10 days. Um, it's, most things are showing 72 hours. We don't think objects are the primary spread um, uh, of the virus. It's mostly airborne, hence all the masking, indoor ventilation type things, which is a little different from what we were thinking back in March and April when this was all newer. We have pretty decent evidence on that. So um, the libraries are slowly opening, you know, back up and saying, yeah, as long as we wipe them off and, you know, do send them home directly and not have there be a lot of open browsing, um, we're, we're probably good. If someone makes the decision that their own health or their child's health is too frail for whatever reason, that they can't take any risk, okay, they can't take any risk. I understand that. But I'm just saying as a matter of general public things, um, probably not a big concern. Okay. I'm going to warn people now, we are not going to get to all the questions in the chat box. I'm doing my best. Okay. So quite a few questions. Actually, Laura, let me just say one thing. Yeah. If we do not get to some key kind of questions or whatever, if you, somebody wants to collate them and send them to me, I'm happy to do, do some brief answers and we can send them out to participants later too. That's very kind. Um, several questions about, I think your compelling um, points about toxic stress. So I'm kind of lumping a bunch of questions together about are there ways to reverse the effects of toxic stress or help children cope better? And a very brass tack, how long can children live in toxic stress before it affects brain development? Do we know the answer to that? Yeah, so the annoying answer that we, we love is it depends. Uh, so uh, here's the way I think about it, right? Um, we get to this whole question of resilience and there's some really interesting studies um, so that were done in Sweden um, and they, they looked at kids' temperament and their, abil their innate ability to cope with changes in their environment. And they used some wonderful Swedish words, which I'm not going to remember, but that translated to, they, they lumped kids into kind of three general categories after they, they, they looked at them. They were the kids that they called 
um, the dandelion children, right? That they did fine almost no matter what, much like a dandelion, right? You, you, you put a dandelion and it's growing out of a crack in the sidewalk. Hey, it does okay, you know, wonderful. But that same dandelion, if you put it in a nice pot and carefully watered, whatever, you're gonna get the same yellow flower, right? No, no difference really. And then they had the orchid children. The orchid children needed absolutely wonderful conditions, but oh my goodness, you got this beautiful orchid. And if they didn't get that, they died, right? Um, like they went did really terribly. So the thing is this pluses and minuses, because what it did was it said, it wasn't just about resilience, it was about how influenced are you by your environment? Mm -hmm. So that's why it, it depends, right? You know, it's hard to know, you know, which, how children will respond and react. And you can't just say, oh, well, if they're in toxic stress situations for this long, because as we pointed out, right, one person's trauma is someone else's light trauma or maybe super trauma, right? Um, so you can't really put all these things. And then the more protective factors you have, they're like, you could argue that a family that got uprooted by a terrible hurricane, their house, their home neighborhood, everything was destroyed. They're, they're being moved between FEMA trailers and whatever, right, Katrina. And yet, if the family supports each other, they actually did pretty well long term, right? Then that's what I'm saying is that the supports piece is the key thing. So yes, we should say, I want to be really careful that we don't fall into this trap of, oh, we need to develop grit and resilience in kids. Well, I think that's actually important. Don't, don't get me wrong. But let's also not accept a world in which children need grit and resilience just to survive, right? We should ask ourselves why we think that's okay. So we need to be making sure all kids have proper housing, proper nutrition, love, their families are employed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And not just say, oh, well, if we just give them grit and resilience, because that locates the problem in the people who are victims of this, that they, they just don't have enough resilience. Well, give me a break. What about our society that's, that's being so cruel? Right. Yeah, I think the Hurricane Katrina study is the most hopeful thing you said tonight because it's what's in your control versus what's not in your control, at least a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have a lot of child care providers in the audience tonight, and we have some questions. I'm going to group a couple of them together and, and let you riff. Um, one was, can you talk about the importance of relationship building when children are in early care and education settings? and the consistency and continuity of caregivers. But then one other, I think, linked question is how can child care providers encourage parents to provide the care and interactions with young children without making the parents feel like they are lacking? Oh, good one. So first of all, consistency matters. And I get it. It's really hard, even in non-pandemic circumstances, when you folks are paid very little and nowhere near what you deserve and you often are economically forced to move to other centers or to leave the field of childcare entirely, right? I, I, I get it, right? That does not help the consistency. It does not help relationships, et cetera, et cetera. Um, totally understand that and get that. So yes, we need more stability in that. And we need it particularly in pandemics when um, many, many childcare centers are small businesses and are, are closing, right? They're, they're already on the edge financially and, and it's gotten even worse. Um, to the question, though, about how to encourage families, and I think this is a this is a one that we all need to keep in mind, whether it's us in healthcare, whether it's home visitors, social workers, etc. We sometimes fall into this, you know. Well, I, I'm I'm here to tell you how to do this, right? Um, I'm the expert, and you don't know how to you know interact with your child, which is a very stigmatizing kind of talking down sort of way, which is just not good, right? So we need to recognize that one of the first things we can do is to sit down, you know, and, and say to families, what are your needs, right? What are your priorities? Because actually they may tell you things that like, you know, yeah, my, one of my big priorities is early literacy, right? Okay. If I walk in and I'm looking and I'm like, this family looks really sad, anxious, worried. I should ask about that. And if we never talk about the book at that checkup, that's fine because finding out that they're about to lose their home, well, I need to help them with that and not fixate on, oh, but what about this book, right? The book is not going to give them a home, right? Fix the home thing first and then come back to the book later. 
And it also builds trust and it centers the relationship in the needs of the families and not in what my agenda is or what the darn template on the, on the electronic medical record says or whatever the case may be. And I think that holds for all of our helping professions. Great points. I'm just gonna do a shameless plug here that there is a link to a survey in the chat box if people wanna give some feedback on tonight. Um, I want to share a comment, not a question that was put in the chat box. You showed some slides. Um, one of them talked about the impact of abuse. And the um, attendee noted that um, I think the, the phrasing of it was about women experiencing domestic abuse. And they really wanted it to be gender neutral or for fathers and men to be included in that because women are not the only people who experience abuse. I thought that was worth sharing an attendee's reaction to those slides. Uh, thank you. If someone later, I'll try to look through and I can uh, help me pick out which slide that is because uh, if, if it was something that was in the study, well, I'm just reporting what the study says. Right. It's, it's a great point though. Yeah. Good point. Agreed. Um, oh, so many questions and it's 728. Um, I think a lot of questions about fears around the first thousand days. Like, what if we didn't get it all right in the first thousand days? Um, how do we help kids catch up? Or is it too late to catch up? Have we missed our window? And a slightly different take on that somebody asked, you know, if, um, if the brain can keep expanding, if there's this plasticity that you talked about, um, why are those first few years so critical? Like, help, help mm -hmm. me reconcile that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's because the brain is most adaptable early on, right? So um, think about, let's, let's look at language development, right? Um, if I decide I want to learn um, uh, to speak Russian, I speak no Russian. If I decide I want to learn Russian now, I'm going to have a really hard time trying to get my head around pronunciation, around remembering language, vocabulary, et cetera. Some people are more gifted than others in that, great. Um, versus if I simply put a young child in a Russian speaking environment, they will actually pick up Russian really quick. It's actually kind of funny, right? I have um, parents, uh, Latino um, uh, families that will say to me, uh, oh, I want my child to learn English because I don't want them to struggle like me. And I'm like, your child will learn English within like months of being in an English speaking school environment. And then you will come in and complain to me that they don't actually talk to you in Spanish at home. Um, right. They soak it up so quickly. So the brain is so adaptable. So the same thing goes with ACEs, right? The brain can adapt, but it can also recover really quickly, et cetera. Now, if I really wanted to, could I learn to speak Russian? Could I learn to speak Japanese? Sure, I could. It just takes a lot more work. So I hope maybe that analogy uh, 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 helps there. Great. Um, do you have any advice um, for parents or caregivers of children who are just very late to talking or to, very delayed in language development? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the, so first of all, if there's a concern about a delay, please bring that to your healthcare provider. Um, I hope they take it seriously and at least refer you for a birth to three evaluation. But remember, you can also refer yourself or a family that you work with for birth to three. It does not need to come from a healthcare provider if you feel like you're not getting the proper attention. And if they say, look, your child has no delay or has a mild delay, it's not a big deal, they will offer some of that support and all. It's language that kids, uh, kids need to be hearing language from people, not products, okay? So the TV doesn't count. And this back and forth interaction does make a difference. But if there's a, a, a moderate to severe delay, that also needs the involvement of a speech language therapist. Yeah. Right. I did, by the way, go back. Yes, that line was in the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, um, mother treated viol violently. Um, yep, that's what they put in there. Um, right. Absolutely right. And some of the newer ACEs studies have gone beyond these 10 to add mm -hmm. other things, including um, making sure it's gender neutral, but also things like experiencing racism and discrimination. Like, can you believe it? That's not on that list, you know? Um, so it's, it's the 10 they used. It was the okay. limitation of what they Thank did. You. 
I'm, I'm sure that is a helpful clarification. I'm gonna throw one more. I know it's 7.31, we started a few minutes late. And um, this question comes from one of our family support centers, so I really want to get it in. Um, do you have any specific suggestions for how we can better support young children of young parents who are isolated due to COVID-19, who mm -hmm. lack positive socioeconomic environments mm -hmm. and are missing out on protective in-person relationships and the rich learning environment provided in their child's center? That is a hard one, isn't it? So. First of all, remember, um, gosh, compared to like just a few decades ago, we have so many other ways to connect with people. I mean, th this lecture would have been canceled um, 30 years ago, right? There, we'd be like, yeah, internet, come on, give me a break, right? There's no such thing. Um, so we can connect with people. I do think we need to be aware that sometimes people don't feel comfortable on camera or they don't feel comfortable showing their homes, um, right? This can be intrusive it's okay to do audio. In fact, I gotta say, I often prefer a meeting that's audio if we don't need to be looking at a document or if it's not the first time I'm meeting someone because I can go and walk. I can take a walk with my dog, you know, while talking to people and, and, and not feel like I'm sitting here all day. So I think those sorts of regular connections do can help. Um, also, offering up ways that people can have time out. Um, I, I'm, I'm a runner. Um, I've run no races this year because they've all been canceled, but um, I've actually been taking up running trails on the weekends, which is not something I frequently do. And it's been just really great because you're further away from people and just enjoying the woods and all. Um, there's alternatives I think that we can offer in terms of supporting people and uh, helping them recognize that it's not just, oh, everything's gone. Well, no, there's still a lot of things out there. It is hard. Also, introverts like myself are perfectly fine with not attending parties, so. Uh. <laughs> I think you had us fooled on the introvert thing. Um, it is 7.33, and I know some people are tuning in after a long day of, of work or parenting or both. Um, so I want to thank everybody for being here. One more plug for the survey link in the chat box. And I thank you all so much. We will look forward to seeing you at our next annual lecture or sooner and hopefully in person. Be well, be safe. Thanks, everybody.